Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. I'll try and be quick here because I went long with the interview. So this episode is good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions. Um, if you're in Saskatchewan, be mindful that we cover a fair bit of investment territory here. So of course, in Saskatchewan, you're only allowed five uh, investment related credits per year. Um, this would be good for a half an accident and sickness credit in Alberta. We talk about investment a little too much here. So I think uh, ASC is only going to give us a half, or sorry, the accreditation committee is only going to give us a half a credit there. Be good for a financial planning credit from FP Canada and a compliance credit on the IROC side. The object for today's episode is a clay jar right here, a clay jar. It's a handmade clay jar that my wife brought back from Afghanistan. You can really see the handmade nature of it when you look carefully. It clearly was not made in a machine. So let's uh, roll into the interview here. I'll try and be respectful of your time. Hi, I'm joined today by John Degui. John is a portfolio manager and really well-known, I'd say, I don't know, media commentator, John, author on uh, matters related to consumer protection in the financial services space. Would I have that about right? Yeah, uh, it, it changes from day to day depending on who you're talking to because people sort of know me from you know different places, but that's fair, yeah. Yeah, I, I know you're on like BNN sometimes, I've read your books, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's at Globe and Mail, I think occasionally, John. Yep, uh, I actually these days I'm running more for the Financial Post for the National Post uh, on uh, in their newsletter on Fridays, but uh, I, I write for other websites as well. So I yeah I'm sort of out there. I do what I can to sort of get people engaged in in all manner of discussions around personal finance, financial planning, capital markets, that sort of thing. Yeah, perfect. And can you tell us a little bit about your practice then? Sure. Uh, I have been in business for, uh, it's 28 years now. I started in September of 1993. Uh, I uh, have been at a couple of firms. I'm a portfolio manager. I manage about $100 million for about 100 families um, and uh, have written uh, a couple of books, one which was updated a few times uh, called The Professional Financial Advisor, another one that came out two and a half years ago called Stand Up to the Financial Services Industry. I've written a bunch of articles and whatnot. And a lot of what I do is sort of, it attempts to, to bridge the gap between investors, consumers of financial advice, and the people who give the advice. Because there are a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions about what goes on and why and how. And I think things can, can be made better by getting the two sides to understand each other better. And mostly that means getting consumers to understand the business because obviously people who work in the business understand consumers because they have clients. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to delve into some more of those uh, misunderstandings a little bit here as we go through. Um, I know that uh, you also have a strong interest in public policy. I've yep. heard this quite a bit from you. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you see that sort of overlap between public policy and the advisory space. And really as you're an individual advisor and you've never other, I know some volunteer stuff, but you've never like filled a regulatory role. I don't think you've ever been a compliance officer or nothing like that, John. I've been a branch manager, so I've done branch compliance, but uh, I haven't done compliance at a, at a major large level. So my interest I don't know exactly where I came from, Jason. That's sort of always been there. I um, have always been a, a consumer advocate, for lack of better terminology. Going back to when I was in graduate school, I did my master's in public administration at Carleton. Carleton is a co-op program. In my first work term, I was working at what was then called the Department of Consumer and Corporate Affairs, looking into credit card rates that consumers were paying and if they could you know, get a better deal and shop the market. And we were doing our job partially just through disclosure and, and, and awareness raising by, by letting consumers know what rates were being charged by the various cards and what terms and conditions they were getting. So that was the sort of thing that I was you know, involved in when I was in my 20s. And I then, the other thing that, that your listeners may not know is that there are lots of people who give financial advice who 
didn't intend to be financial advisors when they when they were in school. They they sort of morph into um, getting into this career because they sort of fall into it because there are no traditional um, paying jobs in a in a sort of salary sort of position available or because they're good with people or because they like things. And these are all good things. But the point that I'm getting at is that it's sort of almost accidental. A lot of people who work as financial advisors didn't aspire to be financial advisors when they were thinking about what they were going to be when they grew up. They just sort of fall into it. And I would be one of those. I mean, I asked this question when I used to be allowed to teach LQP classes, John, um, which I try to stay out of now. And I think other people try to keep me out of there. But you know, I'd ask, like, who in the room envisioned themselves selling insurance one day? And uh, other than the rare exception of the person who was coming into the family business, and even most cases there, they didn't, right? But uh, yeah, I bet you one out of 100 people put up their hand with that question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's the sort of thing where it, it's, I would think that's about right. Maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. But my experience is that the number is still in single digits. There are very few people who I come across who, who do this, who expected to be doing this when they were when they were going to school and thinking about what they were going to be. Yeah, that's exactly it. Now, I'm interested, actually, you mentioned disclosure as, uh, as sort of your early experience with this. Um, yeah. this and I know this is a, a, maybe an unprepared question, John, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> uh, does disclosure work? There's a, there's a professor over at Harvard by the name of Sunita Saw, S-A-H, and she has uh, shown fairly clearly that disclosure doesn't work the way you would expect it to. In fact, in many ways, it, it backfires. So what the research shows, so first off, what the regulators have done is they've said, well, we will, uh, we will improve transparency and we will protect consumers by having uh, companies make disclosures when they offer proprietary products and any conflicts real and perceived will be disclosed. And as a result, that will be attended to. What the research has, has shown is that when in, advisors make those disclosures to their clients, it's almost like it's, a, it's an unintended consequence abuse of the agency issue. And what happens is that is the, uh, the client will say, oh, he seems like a nice guy. He's decent enough to disclose that his firm makes more money when we buy the proprietary product versus the third party product. And since they're all the same to me, let's do this guy a solid and buy, buy him the proprietary product because you know he and his firm can make more money and I'm indifferent. So when, when the end user who makes the decision can't even discern what's in their own best interest, you can see how disclosure can actually not only not be a force for good, but can actually be abused to do more harm than good. I love it so much that you brought up Sunita Saw's research there. I refer to this in my classes too. I know she uh, does a lot of work with George Lowenstein. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes when people hear that kind of thing, they push back and they say, well, these are just a bunch of academics out to get financial advisors. But in fact, Lowenstein and Saw did their first work with physicians, if I'm not mistaken here. So. Yeah, well, so this is a problem with science and evidence. And, you know, we're, we're having this discussion writ large because of COVID and uh, respect for science. Um, uh, researchers, true researchers don't have an ax to grind. They're not looking to find something which is like the big aha gotcha moment. What they're, they're just looking for truth. They're looking for causation. And this is what they found. So there it is. Yeah, I, I have really enjoyed the, the Saw and Lowenstein research. I, I'm glad you brought that up and I'll link to it in the show notes here because I think there's something for really anybody to be learned from reading through that. So yeah, that's yeah. nice. Big win, John, I like it. Um, <laughs> so how does that influence then how you deal with your clients? Well, one of the firms I used to be at uh, is a firm called Asante. And Asante is one of those vertically integrated firms that where we would actually make disclosures because uh, Asante advisors became shareholders. And uh, the idea was that the EBITDA, the, 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 the profitability of the in-house product was substantially like two or three times higher than the, uh, than the third party products. And so the company uh, modus operandi, the business model, they're very open about it and, and you know, the filings for the prospectus and the business plan and whatnot was to convert about 40% of our assets under administration to assets under management. So I, as, a, as an Asante shareholder, made the disclosure, but I 
didn't want that to be um, a factor uh, in my recommendations. And in fact, for a couple of years, I was the largest net redeemer of Asante products in my client base. So, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, I, that I try to do what is genuinely best for the client, as opposed to the, the sort of backdoor, this is going to help me, but as long as you don't care, Mr. Client, let's just do what helps me sort of thing. So I've used it in my practice because I had to, but, but I think I would be a good case study of the unexpected uh, consequence of using the disclosure and making the disclosure, but not necessarily recommending the proprietary product, even though, you know, that's what disclosure was supposed to combat. If, if there are, in fact, unintended consequences and disclosure allows you to do something which is not in the client's best interest, which is to say sell them a, a higher margin product, then I would be one of those rare people who actually made the disclosure and, and, and nonetheless was taking clients out of the higher margin proprietary product. Uh, so that's a bit counterintuitive, but I have used disclosure like that in my practice. More recently, uh, as you uh, will know, all financial planners have an obligation to have a letter of engagement. So that disclosure is being made, what services are being offered, what you can expect. Uh, certainly, I have disclosures with regard to assumptions that I use. And I have a document that I use for all prospective clients. You know, it's, I, call it, um, I call it information summary, but it's just an FAQ document. It just goes over the usual questions that most people would have in writing, how much do you charge? What's your philosophy? What are your services? What's a typical client look like? So I put that all in a simple document and give that to anybody who comes, who calls me or sends me an email saying, hey, can you look at my situation? So that it's all there, it's in writing, there's no question and everyone gets the same document. So that's all there in the beginning. I, I like how you call that an FAQ document. Maybe that should be a frequently should be asked questions document, John, I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's funny you should say that. So my, my last book, um, Stand Up to the Financial Services Industry, actually has about four dozen questions, because as I say, part of what I see as my mission is to help empower consumers have a better relationship with their advisor. But the problem with consumers is they don't know what they don't know. So they would, So most of them are being polite Canadians, don't want to ask. But even if they had the courage to ask, they wouldn't have the wherewithal because they wouldn't have the knowledge of what questions to ask. And finally, and perhaps most dangerously, uh, even if they have the courage and the wherewithal, even if you spoon feed them the questions, they probably don't have discernment in terms of being able to tell whether the advisor that's giving them an answer is full of full of hooey or not. Like, you know, because they, you know, they, I don't know what questions to ask. I'm not confident. The whole reason I'm going to an advisor is because I know that I can't do this on my own. I, you know, I, I'm self-aware with regard to my own limitations. But then the problem is, if you're aware of your own limitations, but you don't know what you don't know, the advisor can tell you virtually anything, and you'll be none the wiser, no matter what he or she does or doesn't say. Do you hear from advisors who have had clients come to them having read either Stand Up or maybe the uh, professional financial advisor? I do, uh, rarely, but yes, and. Um, as you might imagine, um, very few people, very few people in the business are indifferent toward me. Um, I'm either their favorite advisor or their least favorite advisor, depending on the way they run their practice. But it's very difficult to be indifferent towards someone who's trying to empower consumers. If you're doing everything properly, you've got nothing to be afraid of. But those people who you know, are sort of playing fast and loose with rules and regulations, uh, don't like the fact that I'm sort of calling them out with regard to their conduct. That's fair. It's, uh, you know, a case of maybe judging somebody by the enemies they keep or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. If you judge by my enemies, uh, I think uh, you judge me, I would come out looking pretty good because all the, all the, all my favorite advisors, all the advisors that I respect tend to like and respect me and all the people that I think are questionable don't like me, but that's totally fine. I don't want to associate with them anyway. Okay. I mean, that's a pretty clear line in the sand, John. Thanks. I, yeah. <laughs> um, so can we talk a little bit about client focused reforms then? And I, again, I know this is a little bit off script here, but do you feel like client focus reforms, is that a, a focus on disclosure that we're going to see there? Or is it on stuff other than disclosure? Where, where is this going to take us? It's on a number of things. So when I started writing the professional financial uh, advisor in 2001, the book first came out in 2003. 
And here in Ontario, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a senior uh, person at the Ontario Securities Commission, by the name of Julia Dublin, was heading up something called the fair dealing model. And the fair dealing model was used to work on a whole number, a whole host of issues with regard to conflicts, real and perceived, costs, disclosures, suitability, knowing your client, knowing your product, all of those things. And that then ended up being passed on to, as you know, securities are regulated provincially in Canada. So that then went to the, the Canadian Securities Administrators and then, then they, they worked on it. And after many years, it became known as um, um, the, the CSA 1 and CSA 2. Uh, um, so the, the, the client uh, uh, reforms. Uh, um, CFR. CFR sorry. Is, am I getting... uh, no, CRM. 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 The client relationship model. There you go. There we go. CRM yes. one and CRM. So these are the things that are in the, the client focus reforms of 2021 going into effect in January of 2022 are things that literally have been in the hopper and have been worked on with regulators for an entire generation since the turn of the millennium. Uh, so the good news is um, we're making progress. The bad news is it's taken a full generation and it's sort of like, you know, it's uh, glacially slow. But I would say that it's more than just um, disclosure. It's 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 well, it's disclosure with the with the eye to what I'm talking about, helping people to understand their products, understand the cost of their products, the cost of the advice, the impact of those costs, the 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 need for the advisor to know their client, but also to know the products that they're recommending. So th these are all sort of part and parcel with what I've been talking about all along about the interface between the client and the advisor and, and, and vice versa. Okay, yeah. I, do you think that CFR, and notwithstanding the, the long haul to get us here, but do you think CFR hits the mark, the, the reforms that we see this year? I think it's a reasonable step forward. I think there's still more that could be done with regard to product costs. So we've, we've come a long way in terms of helping to consumers to understand how much the advisor and his or her firm are being paid. We're not doing as well as we could, in my estimation, in explaining the, uh, the cost of the products. And, and I think the industry as a whole generally does a poor job of explaining the impact of the cost of the products in terms of how, you know, you know John Bogle has a saying of you, you, you get what you don't pay for. So if you can find a product that costs half a percent or one percent less, then the odds are, all else being equal, you'll experience a return that's half a percent or one percent more as a direct result of not incurring that cost. Most consumers don't think of that, think of things that way, and if uh, you know, uh, ours is the only business I think where cost and quality correlate negatively. So if you're if you're buying a, a phone or a car or a TV, generally speaking, the more expensive phone or car TV uh, is is better than the so the less expensive phone or car TV. But if you're buying um, a mutual fund and it costs one and a half percent with no advisor compensation, and you could be buying an exchange traded fund that uses the same benchmark and, and buys you know essentially the same basket of securities for one quarter of 1%, well, that's one and one quarter percent less in cost. And that goes straight to your bottom line, which is huge. Um, but most consumers say, oh, this product costs way, way more. It must be way, way better. And they don't, they don't stop and think that actually the reason it costs more is because they're getting less because that cost is coming out of their return. Yeah, so, you know, one place where I've seen this uh, cost thing highlighted quite a bit is the Quest Trade ads, right? Um, yeah. Do you think that they get it right? Like, is that is that sort of the model that we should be pointing to here for a, understanding costs? Uh, so Quest Trade ads, and I, I mentioned them two or three times in my book, Stand Up. Um, I'm a big fan of the ads. I think they do a really good job of driving home the importance of cost. Uh, there's another company, RBC, that's been running ads for the past few months where they actually push back and they say, well, you know, I, look how much better my funds have done than yours. And, and then, the, you know, the, the story between the, the young couple is that, you know, I guess, I guess cost isn't the full story. So the, the short answer to your question is yes. I think they do a good job of underscoring cost. But cost is one element of the uh, consideration. It is, in my estimation, 
especially for young people with small accounts and, and plain vanilla situations, in many instances, possibly the most important, but it's certainly not the only consideration. And you, you need to give some thought to, um, if you're uh, an older person with more complex circumstances and, and maybe a little more wealth, uh, then you've got to start thinking about tax and insurance and estate planning and whatnot as well. And then, uh, you know, that then becomes part of the, the consideration. Yeah, and, and I mean, I know you're a financial planner in addition to being a portfolio manager. So I, I know you're not like selling for the lowest cost. I, like your overall structure wouldn't be based on that, right? But but I get what you're so, talking so about yeah. on the investment side. So what, yeah, so what I, again, that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that what you pay as an investor is the sum of the cost of the products and the sum of the cost of the advice that you pay to the advisor. And in some products like traditional A-class mutual funds, those two things are combined in one sort of metric called the MER, the management expense ratio. But when you get your, your end of the year statement saying, how much did I pay to my firm or the advisor? Uh, that's just the commissions and or trailing commissions. It doesn't take into account the, uh, the additional margin that's baked in. So I you know I have a fee schedule, which is, tapered and it it's sort of like you know what a marginal tax rate is like a marginal fee rate the fee goes down as a percentage of assets as the assets get larger but from that point i'm i'm free to shop the market to do whatever i can to look for the lowest cost product and generally speaking all else being equal i've got a pretty strong bias toward the low cost product because i don't think the additional cost adds much value most of the time the exception would be products that you can't readily replicate in a low cost environment. So if you want to get access to an asset class that you can't buy otherwise, then you might have to pay a bit more to get that access. Fair, yeah. Um, what would be, do you have examples of that? Anything you you uh, would put a client in that would not be sure. available low cost? Sure, so um, I've got, uh, I use um, a company that does financing of film deals. Well, there's no way you can, like, you know, you can get an ETF for the TSX, you can get an ETF for the S&P 500, but film deals are, are um, extremely um, reliable, replicable. You know, you get the same sort of payment stream every month, every month. They are, they're even impervious to uh, downturns based on COVID. So you're going to be getting, you know, you, you'll be paying a bit more, but what you're doing is you're buying a basket of things that generally you know, net of fees generate a return in the neighborhood of about 7% with very low volatility and very low sensitivity to interest rates or market environments or anything else. Well, you know, I, I think uh, a seven, I can't say the word guaranteed, but a highly predictable and highly reliable 7% for a portion of your portfolio, even if you have to pay one or one and a quarter or one and a half percent to get that net of fees, that means that you got eight and a quarter or whatever before the fees and you paid one and a quarter in fees and you still got seven, but there's no way you could use something like say a short-term bond product as a, as a proxy and get anything close to 7%, even if that product only costs you 15 basis points. And of course, this is not investment advice. This is a yeah, yeah. general discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Give, yeah. But for, you asked me for an example. So I gave yeah. you an example. They, perfect. Yeah. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, so now, you, I think you even used the word fiduciary a couple of times already, John, if I'm not misremembering, I hear it a lot. So um, yeah. so in Canada, uh, sort of coupled with the client focused reforms, we have this conversation about best interest. Can you just go into this idea of best interest and what does this mean for advisors? Maybe what does it mean for consumers? Sure, let me take a step back before I go in, into that a uh, little bit of weeds by by offering a little bit more of my sort of personal bio. I became a portfolio manager about 10 years ago because I wanted to be a fiduciary. And I tried to take what's called the fiduciary pledge by actually making the disclosure and saying in one or two sentences, I, John DeGuy, hereby act, I promise to act in your best interest. And I would sign, the client would sign it, we would do it, we'd put it in the file so that I could opt in to being a fiduciary because regulation is such that it's somewhat gray. Couldn't do it. My firm's compliance department wouldn't let me do it. And I spoke to prominent people, Gloria Ann Stromberg at the Ontario Securities Commission and Ed Waiter, the former chair of the OSD. And, you know, and they said, your firm's not gonna let you do it. And sure enough, my firm wouldn't let me do it. So 
I wanted to be a fiduciary. I couldn't even volunteer to have myself held to that standard. The only way that I could become a fiduciary is to become a portfolio manager because fiduciary, and now with that little bit of personal background uh, out of the way, I'll now get to the question. A fiduciary is a person who acts uh, by putting the client's interests first. So I always wanted to do that, but I couldn't find a way to do it voluntarily. So I had to give my clients, I had to go to my clients and say, if you give me discretion as a portfolio manager, by virtue of my having discretion, I will be deemed to be a fiduciary. So I wanted to be a fiduciary, but the only way that I could actually get myself to be held to a higher standard was to be a portfolio manager. So that's how I came to be a PM. And that's what a, P, a, a fiduciary is. A fiduciary is a person who acts in their client's best interest, has to act with honesty, integrity, and good faith. So the way that you can remember this is through the letters PM. So a PM is a portfolio manager, which is basically a, a person who does the same things that any other advisor would do, except that there's an investment policy statement in place and the advisor has to sign off and the client signs off. And then the advisor can make trades without speaking to the client first. And because I can make the trades without speaking to the client, that puts me into a fiduciary relationship. That's a PM. The other PM is prudent man. A fiduciary is a person, uh, if, if there comes to the point where a court has to decide whether or not you are acting as a fiduciary, what they do is they apply the so-called prudent man rule. Did you do what a prudent man would do under the circumstances on a balance of probabilities, given that no one knows for sure what the future has in store? So, uh, yeah, I like the the prudent uh, prudent comparison there. I think that's um, valid. So then you have a fiduciary standard with respect to investments, right? So now you hold, you and you have to now, right? You're PM, so this is right. clearly the case. Yeah. How do you look at that overlapping with your, you know, advice around like financial planning matters, estate planning, financial planning, right. insurance, right? How do, how does that right. show up? As you might know, I think you do, because uh, we're both quite involved with FP Canada in various ways. FP Canada has for the past, I'm going to say maybe seven or so years, has sort of gone right up to the line of what it is to be a fiduciary. And um, they can't, because legislation is provincial and because every province is different, um, we're at the point right now where Quebec has been regulating the term financial planner for maybe 18 or 19 years. Ontario has been doing it for about three or four and Saskatchewan for two or three and other provinces are thinking about doing it. There may have been one or two that I've missed. But the point is it's a provincial jurisdiction and not all provinces are doing it. And even then, not all provinces that do it do it the same way. So what you have to do is you have to think of, okay, well, if I want to be a fiduciary, what can I do? And if you're a CFP and there are about 17,000 certified financial planners in Canada, we are all what I might call a near fiduciary, which is to say that we are bound by the same terms and conditions as a precondition of being CFP charter holders, but the force and effect of legislation to enforce it isn't there. So it's about as you know, it's about as close as you can come without it being uh, legislated and, and enshrined in law. Yeah, duty of loyalty is what we see from FP Canada, right? The duty of loyalty yeah. and client so interest firsts. Yeah. Right. And so the the difference is that uh, with regard to financial planning, but also with regard to just investments in general, um, the standard if you're not a fiduciary is just one of suitability. And so the suitability standard is is pretty wide open. Uh, and in fact, I would say that the interpretation of the suitability rule is anything that is not egregiously unsuitable is suitable enough. Um, so yeah, I've heard I it think, say as long I, as it gets the client something closer to doing what they're trying to do. Yeah. 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 So. so I think the standard is a little bit closer to, to um, enshrining the client's best interest. It's still a bit nebulous. Um, I, um, I think you'll know that I, I, I ran a little, in anticipation of this uh, podcast today, I, I ran a little Twitter poll and I, and I asked people, let me just see if I can find it here. Uh, I saw, I saw your, your Twitter poll. I don't think I voted, John. I don't, I don't know if I, uh, uh, we can talk about the question. You don't have but yeah. to. <laughs> okay, so, so here's, here's, here's the question that I asked. Um, and again, it's totally unscientific. So this is strictly for purposes of discussion. I'm not trying to suggest for a moment that there's anything robust here. 
But I asked uh, my Twitter followers, and 17 of them responded. And, and like, the question is this. Were the, were the advisors who invited clients in the Nikkei 225 in 1989 acting as fiduciaries by telling them to hold for the long term when markets tumbled? Note, the Nikkei still hasn't returned to its 1989 level. And the answer were, of the 17 people, uh, seven said absolutely they were fiduciaries. Seven people said absolutely they were not fiduciaries. <laughs> and three of them said, well, the problem is fiduciary is ill-defined. And by the way, you know, one of the questions I, I, I sort of had as a sidebar to my question, how long exactly is the long term? Because we're at 31 years and counting. So maybe, you know, <laughs> I wonder how many people were, you know, invested in the Nikkei 225 that are dead now. But at any rate, you know, I, 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 uh, John Maynard Keynes used to say in the long run, we're all dead. So, <laughs> you know, how, how long exactly is the long run? Anyway, the point in all this is that um, I would say, um, if you can have strong pluralities of respondents saying that absolutely the person was acting as a fiduciary, and then a similarly large plurality of people saying absolutely it wasn't, and then the difference saying, well, it's ill-defined, I, I, I would go so far as to say the fact that the four, 14 of the 17 were evenly split about absolutely yeah. yes and absolutely no, basically just demonstrates that it's ill-defined. I, I think um, the answer as a practical matter is It'll depend on who you talk to. Uh, it's it's difficult to really nail down in a way that I would be confident uh, that you know it's the sort of thing where if it's if there's true smoking gun evidence, it's the sort of thing that you would never have to litigate it because the facts would speak for themselves and the person would be unambiguously innocent or unambiguously guilty and the facts will speak for themselves and you know there it is. But it's not that easy, and that's a concern. Yeah, I mean there and, and there's no like. Well, maybe lawyers would disagree with me here, but I don't think we have a great bright line test in Canada for what is a fiduciary. You know, I know the standard here is to look at Frame B. Smith and all that, but I don't yeah. think that that necessarily holds out nicely for the advisory relationship. Now, I, I yeah, want to follow I up on that, John, I, because one of the things that I hear from people who would be in the camp of people who don't agree with you is that we don't need a fiduciary standard in Canada. We don't need to legislate a fiduciary standard. We don't need advisors to take a fiduciary pledge because the courts will assess ultimately if the advisor was a fiduciary or not. And I don't know if you want to respond to that. Yeah, I. so on the one hand, the, the uh, good two shoes in me says, no, we should do everything we can. The, the practical person to me says, well, given the experience of what I just shared with you with my Twitter uh, uh, case study is that, um, you know, everyone, the, the truth and the, the drawing of the line is in the, in the beholder. And, and as a result, the only way that you are really ever going to get a determination of any kind of conviction and with any kind of teeth is to litigate it. So I think in the end, I, I wish it were the former, but as a reality, I think the reality is that, um, Unless the court's prepared to enforce it, chances are uh, we don't really need anything with more teeth. What I would say is it's sort of like the, um, are you familiar with the so-called broken windows policy where, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in, in, the, in the tipping point, how you can fight crime by, by getting rid of the obvious hallmarks of people that are taking liberties with uh, law enforcement because if law enforcement will allow this to go on, then what else will they allow to go on? So I think by having a, a, a moral compass kind of marker that will serve as a sort of a conscience, as a Jiminy Cricket for advisors, you might be able to, on the margin, mitigate some of the worst impacts, uh, and that's worth something. But I don't want to overstate it. It's, it's certainly not a panacea. It's a step in the right direction, but it probably doesn't get you all that far. Okay, yeah, that's helpful, John. Thanks. Now, do you see any downsides to a fiduciary standard or a best interest standard? No, as I say, it's all good. Any progress is better than no progress. Um, the concern that I would have is I don't want to overstate the amount of progress uh, we're making or the kind of protection consumers would have, even though I actively wanted to be the goody two shoes who would be held to a higher standard. Uh, as a practical matter, I don't really know that there's a big difference. Obviously, I would like there to be a big difference. 
and, and, and to the extent that there can be, and maybe someday there will be. But as we sit here in October of 2021, I don't think there's realistically that big of a difference. Yeah. So maybe the wrong tree to be barking up, like if we're not going to go down that path, what, uh, what changes do you think would maybe have a real material benefit? Where would that big difference show up? I think if we could do a better job of disclosing um, product costs and the impact of costs in general, both the cost of, of products and the cost of advice, that will help clients make more informed decisions. And so, you know, what I really want is for consumers to be able to make an informed decision. And what we're doing is um, directionally correct, but piecemeal and, and of questionable impact. And so uh, I think the big rock that we could still work on is the sort of thing that Quest Trade sort of what works on in their ad campaign, which is why I, uh, I approve of the ad campaign. Okay. Now, um, I know you had wanted to chat a little bit about the agency relationship and how this sort of affects how advice is delivered. What can you give us here around the agency relationship? So the, the thing, and this is sort of what we touched on when I told my story about Asante and disclosure and whatnot, is there, there is a, there's a chance, in my estimation, and, and I'm actually working on a new book, uh, which we'll explore this a bit more, where um, you always have to think about the advisor ostensibly is working for the interest of the client, but the advisor has to hang his or her hat at a firm somewhere, and the firm will have an objective of profit maximization for the firm and the client will have the objective of turn maximization for the client. And ideally in a perfect world, those two things should be um, mutually reinforcing and they should be the sort of thing that you can line up and, you know, I profit when you profit and we will all get along fine. If ever there is an instance where those two things become even moderately mutually exclusive, the advisor then has to make the decision about, well, I have, I'm serving two masters here, my employer and my, and my valued clients. Who's going who's gonna to rule the roost here? Which, you know, which, which, uh, which uh, constituency will I give greater credence to? So as we've discussed here, the, um, the prudent man rule and the fiduciary obligation is such that it has to be the client. But you know, and I know as well that there are commercial objectives that sometimes are difficult to to avoid. You know, firms will sometimes offer incentives, or you know, up until very recently, because that's one of the things that we're dealing with the client focus reforms, is they would give you a better title. You know, they would, you know, if you hit certain targets or did certain metrics, um, you'd be able to hold out as being rather more than what you really are in terms of your competency, and then that in turn. Can have positive spinoffs because I'd rather be working with the vice president as they would be client rather than just the senior financial advisor or what have you. So um, there are there are things that um, you need to be careful about. And I guess what I'm what I'm driving at is advisors. And I don't know that there's a clear solution, but I want consumers to be aware that advisors are frequently at least somewhat conflicted. And they are the most advisors I meet, the very large majority want to do what's right for the client. But virtually all of them also have firms that will say, you know, if you don't produce at a certain level, we're going to reduce your payout rate or what have you. We call it your grid. And and when those sorts of <clears throat> when those sorts of considerations start coming into play, before long, the decisions you make, the recommendations you make start changing at least somewhat. And that's a concern. Yeah, I mean, I agree that, uh, and I deal with thousands of advisors every year. And yes, the people I deal with want to do right by their clients. Right. The tools sometimes are are lacking, or the incentives are sometimes uh, broken. But I I think that is the, like I think that the listeners to this podcast will say the same thing that they want to be doing what is best for their clients. So. Um, yeah, and and my. My experience is that the very, very large majority, I don't know if it's 97% or 99% or whatever, of advisors are, are decent people who want to do the right thing, but we're all human. And, you know, um, the more you tempt someone, the more likely are they are to uh, succumb to the temptation in whatever form. Yeah, I get that. I don't 
Yeah, I don't know if I like the framing of succumb to the temptation. I really think that it's it's more so the case that it's a it's at a subconscious level, right? It's not like there's two options presented but, to you and you but, choose the one that's going to enrich you. Actually, I think we agree. I, I, I'm not trying to suggest that, that there's anything nefarious, no. but even if it's subconscious, it's happening. And and I don't want to I don't want your listeners to be naive to think that it's not happening. I'm not suggesting that 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 advisors are are trying to do anything untoward, but they might be doing something that's untoward, perhaps even unwittingly, perhaps without even realizing it. I just want you know, just want to say that I just want to read it into the record. Yeah, I think that's a fair, uh, fair follow on statement. So um, now, can we you had mentioned earlier uh, that you do some volunteer work with FP Canada. I think you're currently the chair of the research committee, FP, FP Canada Foundation's I, research committee. Am I getting that right? I, I, I'm still ready. I gave up my role as the chair um, in the summer about uh, four months ago. So um, I've I've been serving on that committee now for this is now my fifth year of a six year, I do two, three year terms. So I was the chair of the FP Canada Research Committee Foundation Board for the third and fourth year of my, of my six year term. Uh, and I've done that. I've, I've worked uh, as chairing a, another committee before that called the Recognition and Awards. I chaired that committee for, I'm gonna say six or seven years. And I've been a media ambassador and a public policy ambassador. And I've, you know, I've written, notes to government and made submissions in terms of what we could be doing in terms of the way we legislate financial planning and whatnot as well. So I've done a number of things. And what do you, uh, what do you get, what benefits do you get out of that volunteer work? I, I know that there's like the, uh, I'm not suggesting it's not altruistic, but I'm sure you find you get some benefits out of doing that. I'm hoping you can talk about that a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean. I, I would say that it's mostly altruistic. I, I, okay. I just the way you would volunteer for, you know, coaching little league or teaching Sunday school or doing whatever you do, you do it because you want to give back and it makes you feel good that you're hopefully having a positive impact down the road. But uh, I don't know what I've gotten from it beyond that, but believe me, that's plenty. That's all I want. I don't really want anything beyond that. Yeah, I'm not suggesting like it's helped you to build your book of business or something like that. What I, I guess what I find, John, is that in my dealings with the people who volunteer at FP Canada, I tend to learn a lot. I find that that's a good group of uh, and just good people in general. So I, I don't know. That's been my experience. I, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's fair. Uh, we both, uh, you know, we've been at a number of conferences together and both uh, at various times you and I have both been speakers. And, and it's the sort of thing where... The people who are, if I dare be so bold as to refer to both of us as thought leaders, the people who are thought leaders are thought leaders precisely because they're curious and because they they want things to be better. And and people look to them to say, okay, well, you know, we want things to be better too. What do you think? How, how can we do this? And and I think in that respect, my volunteerism with FP Canada has been rewarding because I think FP Canada has made some some real progress, perhaps. I think there's been more progress made with regard to the regulation of financial planning than there has been with regard to the regulation of financial advice in general. So planning specifically has done has has made more progress. And if you're the sort of person who wants to make progress, it's obviously more fulfilling when the subset of, of one of your tribes is, is doing relatively better. That's fair. Um, can you pick on some things? I, and I know a lot of the work happens behind the scenes here, but... What have you seen yeah. from FP Canada these last four or five years where you've said that's the right stuff? So I, I'm going to say specifically the uh, the regulation of financial planning in English Canada. So we've actually done a lot and worked with a number of provincial ministers of, of finance to to actually say this is a consumer protection industry. There are a lot of people that are holding out, for instance, as financial planners, and they put it on their business card and it looks good. And consumers are are sometimes bamboozled into thinking this guy or this lady uh, is, is qualified when in fact they, they use the term financial planner as a job title without having any credentials at all. And so we've done a good job, we being, I, I got to be careful, FP Canada, where I'm a volunteer, I'm not on staff, so I can't actively speak for them, but FP Canada has done a good job in my estimation in, uh, in actually finally getting some legislative into what I think most people would 
intuitively say is a, is a, is a good thing. In fact, let's, let's go this way. Eight or nine years ago, if you'd have asked a typical Canadian, is financial planning regulated, the term financial planner, holding out as a financial planner, um, the very large majority would have said yes. And in fact, uh, with, with the exception of the province of Quebec until a few years ago, uh, the actual, the correct answer was always no. But increasingly, the answer is coming yes more often. And, and the, what that, that gives consumers some confidence that the person is not going to hold out as being a financial planner unless he or she actually has a financial planning designation and they've actually got some academic rigor behind them when they use that term. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think it's been like it's nice to see the the three provinces that have now uh, New Brunswick is just around the corner from from having its legislation in place. So, yeah, the and yeah, and I'm aware that that all kind of happens behind the scenes that you don't get to see directly that FP Canada, you know, yeah. writes letters and meets with folks, but that happens. We we know that happens. So, yeah. um now can we switch a little bit and chat about investments for a few minutes here, John? I know that uh, we've hardly talked about investments at all. Um, so first off, just staying with the FP Canada theme, I think if I'm not mistaken here, John, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think I've seen you and actually I think a Financial Post article be a little bit critical of some what's in the projection assumption guidelines. Am I misremembering that, John? You are not. I have, again, and I love the people at FP Canada, so these are my friends. But even within the big tent, uh, you, you have to find ways to sort of bring whatever um, moral suasion to bear uh, to, uh, to, to, to get things done in a way that you feel comfortable with. And Martin Dupois, who, uh, who was the, the chair of the committee that did the financial assumption guidelines for many years, has now uh, gone on to be the, the, the chair of the FP Canada board. So an excellent guy, smart, smart guy, he's an actuary. Um, but the methodology that they use and the numbers they come up with, um, I find a bit befuddling. I'm not the only one. We have a mutual friend, Jason Pereira, who shares my concern and others as well. Um, the, the guidelines just strike me as being um, a bit high to begin with, uh, especially when you're getting an assumed rate of return of, let's say, 2.9 on income, when the tenure in Canada has gone to 1.7% and has been below that you know, for some time before that. And then that's the return for the benchmark. But of course, the FP guidelines say quite properly, and I'm, and I'm the person who agitated about putting this in explicitly in the guidelines, again, when you talk about behind the scenes, that that's the cost, that's the return for the benchmark, but proper planning requires that you back out the cost of the product and the cost of the advice. And if the product costs 1% or the, and, the, and the advice costs 1%, then that 2.9% rate of return that you're assuming is actually 0.9%. And, uh, and, you know, a blended, a blended return, especially if inflation is running at 2%, that's a real return of negative 1.1% net of fees. Um, and, that's, and that's using assumptions that are too high <laughs> because cause you're not going to get 2.9 on blood. Yeah. So um, it's, the problem is um, everyone wants – the new book that I'm working on is called Bullshift. It's about how the industry and the financial services industry writ large – shifts people attention to being bullish. It's about optimism bias. And um, I think there's a real concern that um, the industry is sort of nudging up against what might soon be an existential crisis. If, if we come to terms with how low returns or come to terms with how low expected returns will be for the next 10, 15 or 20 years, um, a lot of people will will say, well, what do I need a financial planner for? Or what do I need a financial advisor for? I would be just as well off by putting my money in a bank, getting virtually no return, even if inflation is running rampant. Um, but, but I'll be taking no risk. I won't be exposed to a major market drawdown. I'll save myself the advisory fee and the product cost. And the return differential will not be all that great. And, and I'll sleep at night because as long as I have especially if I have enough money that I can write it out, I don't have to worry about that. So I, I think the industry could be in for a, a bit of soul searching. And I don't think the industry even realizes it yet, but I think it's coming. Yeah, I, I do wonder about that sometimes, you know, when you look at like, because I understand what you're saying, you know, I think the FP Canada projection assumption guidelines give 6.3% for Canadian equity, 
So if you've got sort of an investor who's that way, you know, but build a, now a balanced portfolio with fees and, you know, the returns right. in there come to something like three or 3.2%. And before the cost, then you back out another one and a half percent in costs. Yeah. So, and, you know, and you're looking, now, yeah. Now you're which is zero percent real because inflation. So, it's that kind of thing where I see I see advisors hesitant to do this, right? And I still see like you know I asked the question in class. Let's use a reasonable rate of return for twenty years, and people come back with you know seven percent or that kind of thing. And yeah, that's it's point. a 7% yeah. not reasonable. That's 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 the thing that no one wants to deal with. Uh, uh, it's sort of like and and I don't want to get political here, but I have a lot of friends like you in Alberta. I find Albertans are having a harder time acknowledging climate change. And it's there's a, there's a certain amount of self-interest. And it's uh, what's the old saying that uh, uh, um, it's difficult for a man to to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. That's the uh, Upton Sinclair quote. And I think it's very difficult for people who work in the oil patch to acknowledge that the release of CO2 is harming the environment. And it's very difficult for people who, who give financial advice, sell financial products, and, and, and are trying to convince people to take steps to secure a better financial future that to acknowledge that the fees that they charge are actually going to be a significant draw on the objectives of the clients that they're trying to help. You know, And, and that's, that's a real part of the agency issue that we touched on 15 minutes ago is that do you really want to come clean completely about uh, the importance of cost? Because that's just the product cost. It's also the cost of the advice. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I understand what you're saying here. If I've been sort of selling the ability to generate returns as my primary selling feature, then yeah, the low returns are really going to beat me up. But if I've been selling the idea of helping somebody to better understand the relationship with money or helping them to you know, understand their financial objectives and accomplish those objectives, then the return environment shouldn't really matter. I think, is that fair? But, but we both know it does. It shouldn't. It's one of those things where you've got the normative, this shouldn't matter, and then you've got the realistic, but we all know it does. Right. Uh, I think the people who help people, help their clients uh, quantify and articulate and focus on and work toward their life goals are better uh, at, at, at actually accomplishing those objectives and are less inclined to succumb to the natural um, tendency to overstate expected returns. But less inclined does not mean not inclined. It, it's just less severe. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my, uh, I think my last question here, it's hard to look at your Twitter feed, John, without noticing from time to time you might post something in there about a bubble. Yeah. I'm not... I'm not yeah. uh, putting, yeah, I actually, honestly, John, when I saw your um, your reference to the Nikkei in 1989, I assumed that's what you were sort of driving at with that. I think, uh, I thought maybe you were pointing well, to I, the it, fact, so. Two words of uh, so, no, it, it, was, it was a good way to sort of, I've told the bubble story uh, in various ways, probably two or three different, two or three dozen different ways over the past year. Um, and And I point out to, I, a lot of people sort of dismiss me, so I was like, "Okay, well, don't take it from me. Take it from Jim Rogers. Take it, you know, take it from whomever, Jeremy Grantham or whoever else that that also thinks that we're in multiple bubbles uh, because of stocks, bonds, and real estate." Um, but I I managed to find a way to tie it into our conversation about fiduciaries because it's interesting because the question that it begs is, well, how much of a fiduciary are you if you give advice heading into a bubble, and if the bubble doesn't burst, then does does that? Okay, let me make a step back here. Do you know who Annie Duke is? Yeah. Annie Duke wrote a couple of books. Her most her most famous book is a book called Thinking in Bets. And at the beginning of Thinking in Bets, she tells the story of uh, about the concept of resulting, where this coach uh, Bill Carroll of the Seattle Seahawks made a decision to to pass it at second and goal with one minute left in the Super Bowl, and his yes, team would have won. I, I remember the court. play. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so in the end, instead of giving the ball to uh, their star running back and just punching the ball in from the one yard line, uh, he called a pass play, and the the the, uh, the the quarterback was intercepted, and New England got the ball back, and 
the game was over, uh, New England just won the Super Bowl by intercepting a pass that didn't have to be a pass. And he was pilloried uh, as a result of, of the, uh, the decision, the play call by the media and, and by his fans and by everyone else uh, you know, after the game. But Duke shows very clearly that this is really, you're making a decision, about, you're making a, a determination about the decision when you know what the result is. But he didn't know it was going to be intercepted. You know, so if you look at it statistically, only about 1% of pass attempts on the one-yard line get intercepted. So was there a chance? Yes. Was it probable? No. And, and as you go through the entire um, process, you, you, you realize that a lot of the decisions you might be making with regard to uh, is the person acting like a fiduciary is similar. You, you'll make the decision in hindsight, and if the market went way up or the market went way down, that might change the way you think about the prudence and suitability of the advice and whether or not the person was acting like a fiduciary, but it should be unambiguous. It should be, if the person was doing what was seemed to be as right for the client, it should be right no matter what the outcome is. So in that context then, um, if I, okay, so let's say that I'm agnostic. I don't know if there's a bubble coming or not, right? And, or a bubble about to burst. And honestly, I mean, this is the kind of challenge here is, let's say that I do accept that there's a bubble. Well, is it going to pop tomorrow? Is it going to pop in three months or six months or 15 months? How do I right. react to that then as an advisor? Well, this is um, uh, one of those situations where you, you have to think about it in terms of, and this is why I asked the question on Twitter, because people react differently. Um, the, the people who didn't get the clients out in 1989 according to a number of my Twitter followers said, no, what was done was prudent. Uh, you should, if you're going to buy and hold, then financial planning 101 and, and advisor uh, value add in terms of the, the presumptive behavior modification 101 says getting clients to hold is a big part of the value proposition. And, and that's, that's the unambiguously right thing to do all the time. And I wanted to sort of challenge the all the time part because, well, nobody knows when the market's going to pop. No one even knows if it's going to pop. If it pops, no one knows when, no one knows why, how, how deep it will be, how long it will last. No one knows any of those things. But if, if we have a set of presumptive, prescriptive, best practice kinds of blanket recommendations that are deemed to be consistent with what a fiduciary is that are generally ex accepted, then it seems to me, is it true that those facts never matter? Because that's sort of what I'm hearing people say. You know, well, he acted like a fiduciary, even though he knew full well that the Nikkei was trading at 100 times earnings. <laughs> and and that, that's just simply not sustainable. But, you know, in the long run, markets will come back. I should also actually add for your, for your listeners that not only has the Nikkei not come back, to its level that it was at in 1989, 31 years later, it's actually 30% below where it was in 1989. So not only are you, not only have you not made it back to where you were, you're still 30% lower 31 years later. So, yeah, and I still find like, that's interesting and sort of scary, but still, what do you do with it? No. I, I, and. So that question, I think, is maybe more rhetorical than substantive, because I'm now asking people, and this is what I'm going to be exploring more in the book, is, but if you're always being prudent, irrespective of the facts, even if you're down 30% 30 years later, but you did what you believe was right because holding... Uh, in some portion, and, and again, I don't know, this is like, a t I, I'm using the Japanese stock market as an example, but my understanding is that in Japan, there's a great deal of home bias. And a lot of people in Japan in the 1980s were invested entirely or almost entirely in, in Japanese stock. Certainly in Canada, with uh, Canadian investors until the late 1990s, you, you could only have you know, 10% going up to ultimately, I think by the early 2000s, 20% of your RSP outside of Canada until intrepid product uh, suppliers found ways around the foreign content rules and the government said, oh, to heck with it. And yeah. the foreign content rule for RSPs went out the window. 
But in 1989, I don't think there were any such rules that that would allow you to. I don't think there was any way for most retail investors, small people, mom and pop investors, to invest outside of Japan. They they basically, if you wanted to invest in stocks, you had to invest primarily, if not entirely, in Japanese stocks, which were trading at 100 times earnings, which is madness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So I, I like that perspective, John. I think that points to still a response. Of, like, I'm in Alberta. You don't tell me about home bias, John. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, you know, the idea that there are things we can do here, right? And, you know, good foundational principles of asset management, warning clients, what happens if, you know, good psychological screening. So, yeah, I, I think that's good. I think that, you know, my my fear here is that you have somebody who says, well, the bubble is going to pop tomorrow. Like they read, you know, Robert Kiyosaki and they say, you know, he says it's going to burst tomorrow, which of course he said like whatever number of times over the last decade. Um, yeah. And they move all to cash, right? And, and that yeah. to me, like that, that's a, if I'm a fiduciary, right? And I move all my clients to cash. I think that that's sort of, equally ignorant about you know what can happen or you know sort of equally ignorant of the current circumstances so i'll, I'll push back on that um i the, the problem is nobody knows and that and yeah. no, but nobody knows goes for both sides the, the people who are saying stay invested and the people who are saying go to cash both sides are presumably acting in a way that a prudent man might act. Uh, you know, one test of the prudent man rule is, well, you should treat the money as if it was your own. So what did you do? So if the prudent man advisor goes to cash, it would stand to reason that, that that's what would happen with his or her clients. And in fact, I would argue that it's a bit of a smoking gun if the advisor goes to cash and the clients don't. Uh, and 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 I suppose vice versa as well. If if the advisor is doing something which is which is conspicuously at odds with what his clients are doing, and the advisor has discretion, then then what makes uh, unless the client has a truly uh, uncommon investment policy statement, risk tolerance, risk profile, uh, risk capacity, what have you, but it, 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 working on the assumption that the advisor's um, metrics and markers are broadly similar to those of his typical clients, one would expect that his his behavior with regard to market conditions would be broadly similar to what he does with his clients. And again, resulting, anybody can, if, if you can't give, if you can't say that an advisor was not being a fiduciary by not going, by not selling out and writing it down, and it's down by 30% 30 years later, um, then I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that, that you can really give them heck for doing it a year or six months or 18 months or 24 months early, uh, especially if you avoid a major drawdown. Um, I, I'm not saying that I 100% think that, but I'm certainly not convinced that, that staying all long, all the time, uh, valuations be damned. I mean, I, as as you know, one of the reasons I I'm worried about a bubble is not just because it's me, and it's not just, and it's certainly not. I think I've, I think I've mentioned Kobayashi Kobayashi once, but um, uh, people. It's mostly the hedge fund managers. It's it's the Ray Dalio's, the Jeremy Grantham's, the the Peter Schiff's, the 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 uh, um, Jim Rogers of the world that. Um, manage billions of dollars that can go long and short that are ringing the alarm bells with regard to um, a possible bubble. But people who are long only managers who have the, uh, who don't even have the capacity to, to go short, they have a vested interest in, in saying there's nothing to see here and you don't have to worry about bubbles and we don't, we don't worry about that because they can't go short they're they're precluded from their own investment policy and their own mandate, and as a result, they they have a they're sort of forced to make it sound like everything is fine, and they will say everything is fine whether stocks are trading at 20 times or 50 times or 100 times earnings. It doesn't matter as far as they're concerned. You can't time markets. There's nothing to see here. We're going to stay long. We're not going to do anything, and 
they might rebalance or trim a little bit, but the bottom line is they will always stay invested, even though it should be obvious that there's a great deal of risk. The S&P 500 right now is trading at cyclically adjusted earnings of about 39 times, which is more than double the historical average, which is another way of saying the market could drop by 50% tomorrow, and it would still be expensive based on historical valuations. That scares me. I'm full out. I'm, I'm saying I, I'm worried about this, and, and here's why. So yeah. there it is. <laughs> yeah, you make a good argument, John. I, I like it, and I think your position, it's obviously well considered. You've got you know some data to support it. It's a, it's a hard thing to get into the, the market timing question. I think that's maybe the big challenge I have here is it, it just seems well, and, like. And, so it, and here's the way I would then portray it, Jason, is, is because um, the problem that I have is that my, my critics, call it market timing and and you know i i would say that uh doing some of the things that you've mentioned would be more in keeping with the intent of risk management so now we can get into the semantics well you know it's it's if you sell things off are you timing markets or are you managing risk well you can make the case either way but but the industry has has taken the view that um, market timing is a very bad thing and risk management is a good thing, even though we're talking about the same thing. It's just the way we spin it. And, and so now it's a question of degree. It's a question of you know, conviction. Do you have discretion? And now we can get into the, the niceties of, well, what was the person intending? And um, what I know is uh, there's this guy, by Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize in 2002 for his work on prospect theory. And he's shown with a great deal of rigor that the pain of a loss is twice as acute as the joy of a gain. So you feel, if you start with a million dollar portfolio, you feel a lot worse if you drop down to 900,000 than if you go up to 1.1 million. You feel twice as bad about the loss as you, as you would feel about the, the, you know, the happiness of a gain. So I could argue that um, minimizing large drawdown, even if it means foregoing gains before the fact, uh, could very well provide a, a defensible, robust, quantifiable, empirically uh, explainable rationale for selling significant amounts of the portfolio out even before things start dropping. Yeah, we'll see. I see. Yeah, yeah, it's a fair point, John. Absolutely. So uh, on that note, um, we're going to wrap up here. I think that it would be good to come back. We didn't even get to uh, misguided beliefs of financial advisors, for example, which I know is a favorite topic of yours. And I feel like there's probably yeah. a few more things we should unpack here. But uh, yeah, that was great. I feel like uh, you did a, a really great job of explaining sort of how um, both regulatory and non-regulatory perspectives point to how advisors deal with their clients. We got to talk a little bit about fiduciary standard, the stuff with FP Canada, and of course, the uh, the the question of bubbles and how we deal with those. So um, any last minute comments for us, John? Uh, Jason, I want to thank you for inviting me to, to participate. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, no, just uh, maybe you can uh, have your uh, have your listeners maybe follow me on Twitter, um, which is uh, at standup underscore today. Uh, and uh, that's it. Yeah, that's beautiful. And always a pleasure to talk to you, John. Really appreciate it and appreciate your willingness to share. And I know you're just looking to make this a, a better a better home for advisors and consumers. So thanks. Thank you. Okay. okay, the number for this episode is four. Again, the number is four. And I hope you'll join me again in two weeks when we'll have another interview with a tech entrepreneur. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for joining us. You'll be able to do your quiz by creating an account and subscribing for $15 a month or $150 a year at businesscareercollege.com. Those who subscribe on an annual basis will also have access to three half-day continuing education seminars covering a variety of topics and capturing a range of different continuing education credit requirements. In order to get your credits for this episode, you'll have to do a short five-question quiz. You'll need the number that I went over just after the interview, the object that I displayed at the beginning of the interview, and you'll also have to recall a few details, nothing too challenging from the episode. 
once you have completed the quiz, within the course where you did the quiz, you'll be able to click at the top right corner. And from there, you'll be able to choose the option to view wall certificate. That's how you'll see your CE credits. Hang on to that, although the system will hang on to it as well. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in getting this episode to air. Jocelyn Lord and Sushami Pamalupaket are the amazing marketing team at We Know Training, which is Business Career College's parent company. Sush also does our video content. Joseph Tong composed the theme music and does the sound editing for every episode, as well as uploads the episodes to all audio platforms. Maria Nguyen takes care of all our CE approvals.